bright tent in a high meadow. Meeting place for ideas. Aspen, for more than 10 summers, home of the International Design Conference. Walter Pepke dreamed it up. Characteristically, he also made the moves, enlisted the support, paid the costs to convert dream to reality. Eero Saarinen designed a tent amphitheater and, with the help of many other people dedicated to the idea, IDC was a going concern in Aspen. But why Aspen, you might ask, if you hadn't been there? Other places undoubtedly match Aspen's attributes, at least the ones pertinent to creatively oriented conclaves. It couldn't be primarily the Old West aspects. Certainly other Colorado towns loom larger on the historical scene. This was amply demonstrated in a definitive volume published in 1880, which made much of some of the places you will pass through on the way to Aspen. Places like Denver, of course, and Silver Plume, and Georgetown, and Leadville. Leadville was Colorado's second city in 1880, with 25,000 people. Aspen's day was yet to come, and it's still coming, long after the digging is all done in Leadville and Georgetown and Silver Plume. Coming to Aspen is still picturesque, no matter how you negotiate. And in the first 10 summers of IDCA, some 5,000 people made the dramatic trek, one way or another. But it wasn't the spectacular nature of the approaches that attracted them to Aspen. They came to look, to talk, and to listen. They came to be enlightened and to be entertained. They came to get together and to get away. They came for some or all of these reasons to ask them. They came to see and hear and talk with 159 panelists and to each other on such related subjects as communication, human values, direction of the arts, design and human problems, the corporation and the designer. In 10 years, there were 10 themes divided into 30 cycles. These 10 themes and 30 cycles and 159 panelists subdivided still further into an undoubtedly impressive but happily unrecorded number of smaller discussions not necessarily related to the scheduled conference theme. So much for the starkly statistical data on IDCA's first decade. More important, what is an Aspen Design Conference really like? What makes it go? The second question can be answered quickly. The international design conferences work mostly because a relatively small number of devoted people apply large amounts of their own time to make them work. Since the permanent IDCA organization was incorporated in 1955, the executive committee, elected every year by the membership, plans and governs each conference and provides the continuity of far-ranging effort which keeps the organization moving ahead between conferences. Although programs are planned months, even years, in advance, there is much to be done on the conference scene. Breakfast meetings of the executive committee produce the first official business of each conference day. These invariably express the purposeful informality, which has come to be the Aspen style. Conference sessions start at 9.30 in the tent. Attire is informal for the most part. Humor is good, as a rule. Anticipation is keen, or should be, for no conference day is without its own special contribution to the Aspen story, the feeling of which we hope to convey in this film. Perhaps excerpts from many mornings across the first decade 
will impart something of the scope of IDCA. It should be noted that the necessary departure from context has been carefully effected to minimize any detriment to the original communication. Most conferences start with brief tributes to the setting. And I find that to be here and to experience this charged atmosphere that is the design conference is a stimulating experience. Very soon, however, the scheduled business is taken up. I do urge you to take me seriously on this and decide that we are not here merely for a pleasant stay in the mountains, not to hear a few speeches and then go back to the mess that we are in and uh, not even in a position to criticize. But more words inevitably come before the recommended action. Some of them relate, not surprisingly, to design. And that is that good design, really good design, can help a corporation achieve anything it wants to achieve, including profit. I have not seen any example of where market research has destroyed good design in our company. Maybe we haven't applied enough of it. As if anticipating future inquiry on the subject, a panelist five years earlier made this unequivocal statement. We cannot help but be subjective if we are to be creative. We cannot help but fumble and grope most unscientifically if we are to create. Another panelist in another conference corroborated this judgment in his own way. Uh, I think uh, the biggest mistake a designer can make is that he thinks he is a businessman and uh, forgets that he is an artist. I would like to suggest that we take uh, a short break right now. Please don't go too far. Interesting exhibitions are featured at every conference, ranging from the work of design students to examples of the creative efforts of current panelists. Some delegates enrich their break periods with generous drafts of bracing Colorado air before reconvening for the morning's second round. The special point of view of the imaginative businessman was frequently exemplified by the statements of Walter Pepke to the conference, in this instance on the subject of leisure activity and the happiness it should promote. I think you'll remember Montessori once said that if man only wanted to be happy, this would be rather easy to accomplish. But most people want to be happier than their neighbor, and that's very difficult because we believe our neighbor to be happier than we are. Oh, uh, I think, however, the Aristotelian thought, which is undoubtedly in the minds of many of us, is that happiness is largely the growing or the development to your highest potential. Echoing the need for greater development, another panelist made this point. Well, the, there is a terrific plea the leadership on the one hand in our society and, group, and a horrible form of group adjustment on the other, we have to recognize the fact that most of our leadership, particularly in terms of leisure, is now coming not from people, but from institutions. The institutions of TB, the comic book, and other destructive forces which are destructive not in themselves, but in the way in which they're being used. Professional standards and ideals must envision something beyond what even the best in the society or the best of the group now has. While discoursing on the need for intelligent city planning, an earlier panelist reduced the design problem to architectural terms. Architecture's most urgent mission is to convert chaos into order, change mechanization from a tyrant to a slave, and thus make place for beauty where there is vulgarity and ugliness. Suburbia with phony respectability and genuine boredom, effectively isolated from the world by traffic jams. And so, a mosaic of morning sessions ends, and the tent disgorges its assemblage for lunch, a period of great possibilities gastronomical and sociable. Directions initiated in the tent are often maintained in the colorful variety of luncheon settings provided by Aspen. This extracurricular discussion tendency is not limited to restaurants, however. Any convenient wall, patch of green sward, or a poolside table converts easily into a site for significant conversation.
in the afternoon, the IDCA show moves out of the big tent and goes on the road, with each of the day's panelists playing 45-minute stands in each of three seminar locations. This decentralization permits less formal mutual investigation of the day's theme cycle by panelists and smaller segments of the general conference membership. Flanked by a seminar leader, the panelist takes the questions as they come and delegates get the opportunity to speak up for or against attitudes communicated by conference leaders. By the time panelists have made all the seminar stops, they have pretty tangible evidence of popular conference response to their points of view. After seminar sessions, IDCA delegates have some three hours for dinner and other forms of relaxation before the evening schedule. These sometimes take the form of visits in interesting Aspen homes and studios. Every year, there's a big poolside party at the Hotel Jerome, a high social point of Aspen Week. Restaurants galore take it from there. And if you observe reasonable discipline on timing, you will arrive at the Wheeler Opera House for the first of the night's films or slide presentations. Film fair at international design conferences has developed to the point of making the evenings add up to a veritable film festival. Part of each program relates to the succeeding day's conference cycle, but additional selections are screened simply because they are of the caliber likely to be appreciated by the conference membership. are traditionally unscheduled conference-wise. After two days of comprehensive consideration of the IDCA theme, conferees and panelists are set at liberty for the pursuit of happiness, which abounds in many seductive guises among the rocks and rills of Aspen. Pleasures of the water, rushing or otherwise, appeal to many. Others take the cable-threaded high road, recently and reluctantly abandoned for the season by legions of skiers. This time of year, you may ride down with no fear of derision. Another favorite junket is the highly scenic drive to the famed Husky Kennels at Toklat. The recreational opportunities are too richly variegated to catalog here. Suffice to say, Wednesdays in and around Aspen are memorable indeed.
come Thursday, the conference is back at its regular stand, and the membership has a second wind with which to pursue the remaining portions of the theme. It may be that there is somebody in this audience who has an idea. Uh, I don't know if there is. Such people are very rare. By Friday, the subject has been sufficiently prepared for final assault by the full panel. We have here on the platform the human resources of this conference. The final act, and often the highlight of each conference, is the summary speech. All of these have been noteworthy. One in particular is often quoted, that of England's Jacob Bronowski, who summarized the 1957 International Design Conference. Here are excerpts. There would be no design problem if there were not machine production with the enormous markets to which it caters. Now the designer's problem in this sense is really very simple. And that is that it's often easier to create the illusion of fulfillment than to offer people a real fulfillment. That the designer has to choose between handing out something as a drug or as a food. Now the difference between a drug and a food is the drug it creates the illusion of well-being and the food really adds to your well-being. About this, I would only say one thing, that I am very sorry for drug addicts, but what I should really hate to be is a drug peddler. Well, that's pretty much the way IDCA works. Each conference differs from the others in many small ways, and in a few big ways. But any and all of them are rewarding to attend. There is little doubt that both design and designers have made progress since the first conference in 1951. It is the aim of this organization to strengthen continuously not only design and designers, but all of the positive aspects of design's relationship to our total culture in the decades ahead.